All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Tonight, uh, Egyptian civilization and language, hieroglyphics and Demotic and Coptic and Hieratic and all kinds of exciting things coming at you tonight. Um, does anybody remember when the Tutankhamun discoveries were made and then they toured the United States, I think it was the mid-80s? Anybody see that? Okay, so spectacular. That find underlined basically the entirety of our experience with Egyptian history. Everybody, as for as long as we have recorded history, has said, man, the Egypts, the Egyptians have it going on. This is the essential thing. They, they're smart, they're rich, and they're not terrifying. This is an interesting mix. For most of history, we get this from the Greeks and the Roman tradition, some from the Persian, outside groups who had encountered them, because hieroglyphics had not been translated. And generally, the received opinion was, well, yes, the pyramids are very large, but this is all exaggerated. Really, it couldn't have been that impressive. <laughs> ah, ever since the discovery of the Rosetta Stone, which you have a, a, a picture of there on the back, and we'll talk about that a little more later, uh, and its translation and the subsequent archaeological work that has gone on nonstop right up till today, it's just more and more impressive. The discovery of Tutankhamun means hundreds of pounds of precious metal in there. And this was not a particularly wealthy tomb. I mean, this is one of the things they're saying. They're saying, the Egyptians didn't think like, wow, this is the greatest burial we've ever done. They're like, you know, we do a good job, but it's not spectacular. <laughs> and and the, just the discoveries that we've made since then and the ongoing archaeological discoveries in Egypt let us know that this is one of the most astounding civilizations uh, in history. And its influence, which we'll talk about at the end, is continues unbroken on our lives today. Uh, one of the things to keep in mind, I mentioned this last time, I really want to emphasize this this time also, is the amount of scholarly work that has gone into uh, three or four centuries worth, but really over the last 150, 200 years, to try and bring alive the, uh, this tradition. The, the most famous guy um, that we're probably talking about is the uh, French guy Champion, who was one of the savants who, who discovered the, the Rosetta Stone. He was in the, the group of savants that went with Napoleon into Egypt. Yeah, Napoleon was not there for archaeological research, by the way. Uh, he was there purely for conquering, but he took a lot of the so-called savants, scientists, with him. Um, and they discovered, famously, the Rosetta Stone, and then a whole big debate about who owned the Rosetta Stone and where was it going to end up. Of course, it ended up in the Brit British Museum, where all Egyptian artifacts belong. Uh, apparently, right? If you ask the British Museum people, like, well, there's their ours, of course, obviously. Uh, but he worked for about the next 30 years to try and translate this. And when we get to the language, you'll see, well, this, I mean, an unbelievably difficult task. I, when, you, when you hear about this, it, it shouldn't be possible. But, but he finally broke it, and uh, Young, also a British scientist, very influential and helpful in doing this. But it's just been years and years, and that was just a rough translation, the first one. Today, if you look at the Egyptian scholarship, lots and lots of big arguments, not little arguments, about what all this means. I mean, so it's not like we're done. It's not like, we're, oh, we've got it, you know, we can translate it, no problem, don't worry about it. No, it's still an ongoing field. But it's, it's, we, we stand, the, again, we inherit a past like that of the richness of the Egyptian civilization from the living labor of men and women uh, who continue to produce the artifacts, the interpretation, the translations, the reproductions that allow us to embrace it. So a civilization like the Sumerians that we talked about last time, the cuneiform civilizations, or the Egyptian civilizations, the Sanskrit civilizations, come to us only because... They're living in our minds and our lives and our research and their reproductions. That's why I said last time the Humane Art series was about how we live these lives. This is what they produce. People living these lives focused on research and dedicated to these kinds of activities have recreated for us in some ways a connection with the past that would otherwise never exist. So it's just astonishing. I sort of, I'm in awe when I, when I read through this material. 
Let's take a look at the timeline there of Egyptian history. Because um, it's amazing. So you go uh, 3,000 to 2,700. This is pre-dynastic. This is before the Upper Nile and the Lower Nile, the Upper and Lower Kingdom as they're called, are joined. Most of the, there's, there's architecture, there's art, but none of the monumental activity that we associate with the great periods of Egyptian power have started. Then you get what's called the Old Kingdom. All the really big pyramids, these are the oldest things they built. This is the Old Kingdom work. They did things right back in the day, you know, sort of, sort of very impressively big, if nothing else. Uh, these are pre. This is this is from 2700 to 2100. So, so just pause and think about that for a moment. It's 600 years of, as far as the archaeological record and the written record that we have from the temples, pretty much of unbroken peace and prosperity. 600 years. It's, it's just astonishing. And if you look at the Nile, when you think about that, on the right of the Nile, if you're looking at the map, is the Arabian Desert. And that is a desert with a capital D, Desert. There is nothing there. you got Nile is like a line in the sand. Once you get past the irrigation level of the Nile, dealing with the floods, it's death. There is just nothing. A few oases, but really most of the oases are on the left, if you're looking at this map. On the other side, you have a whole bunch of desert also. And importantly, the Egyptians more or less ruled the sea with the Phoenicians. It's not sure what that relationship was, but they seem to be mostly partners. And so their coastline they controlled, their left and the right is desert, and north of them they had to deal with the tribes up there, off and on, friendly, sometimes not, but mostly not a threat. So almost an island civilization in a way. So you get this interregnum uh, from 2100 to 2050, a uh, collapse of the old kingdom. Now this is 50 years, so 600 years of peace, 50 years, it, 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 it explodes. The, the Nile changed its flood pattern. It fell, it's you know, exactly the figure, but it, it, it lowered about 12 meters, it looks like, or 12 feet, it looks like. That doesn't sound like a lot, but it means that you know, like 40% of the arable land became, they couldn't irrigate it. Because they could, you know, they're lifting the water into canals, they need the, the new soil to refresh it. Um, and so their whole, you know, a whole bunch of what was irrigated became, you couldn't irrigate it. And this just blew up the old kingdom. And there's, it, that's, the, that's the end of the really big pyramids. Um, and when, when they come back, so that's not a long period, 50 years, but it is a major shift. It took them a while to come back from that blow. You can imagine how devastating that would be. Uh, the closest I could come to, I was trying to think of an analogy, it would be as if tomorrow we realized that we only have maybe 50% of the oil that we thought we had. So it seems expensive now at force 25 a gallon, but all of a sudden it was $30 a gallon. Right? It's going to slow us down for a bit. Right? We're going to, it's going to take a little bit of a, a little shine off of things until we recover and adjust. And then you come back and you get the middle kingdom. Uh, the middle kingdom goes you know, for 300 more years. Another huge, that's 100 years longer than we've been a country. And we had a civil war. Right? So it, it, a much, another huge span of unbroken prosperity. Potentially, the wealthiest period in Egyptian history is the Middle Kingdom. And we'll, we'll talk about that. Impressively wealthy. Then you get this period of civil wars and disunity, followed by the New Kingdom. 500 more years of more or less unbroken prosperity. During the New Kingdom, they also did a lot more um, colonizing. They, they did a lot more expansion. So the, the largest Egypt ever come, becomes is, is more or less under the new kingdom. They're much more cosmopolitan and reaching out to conquered states. Well, conquering is not quite the right word, but sort of uh, tribute states who paid them a lot of money and imported a lot of goods for them, a lot more trading. And then it all kinds of fall apart, falls apart. Uh, civil war, outside dominance by the Libyans, the Assyrians, and the Kushites. Um, 
And then they're controlled mostly by the Persians for 525 to 332 there. And then the Greeks take over, the Ptolemaic Greeks, Alexander, you may have heard of him, uh, came marching in to see what was going on. And then his followers, the Ptolemies, the, the, they, they take over and run until the Romans show up. Um, this is you know, the famous period of Cleopatra. It's important to remember that Cleopatra was a Ptolemaic Greek ruler. We, we, you know, we think of her as... You know, the ruler of Egypt, she was, but she was Ptolemaic Greek. She's, she's not, um, you know, I guess, traditional uh, uh, Egyptian pharaoh. Um, and then you get Rome, the Roman incursion, which then becomes the Byzantine Empire, right? We, think, we always think of Rome as falling. Well, that's the western part of Rome. The Byzantine part of Rome, eastern Rome, did not fall. And so you have Rome hanging out uh, there as the Byzantine Empire until about 641, Ish. And then and then the Arabs show up, which is where we are today. Right? So Egypt then, then conquered by the Arabs. So, but in the earlier history, which we're going to be focusing on, the old kingdom, the middle kingdom, and the new kingdom, you can see you have a period of six hundred years, and then a period of you know three hundred years, and then a period of five hundred years of peaceful, prosperous, unbroken unity to a degree that everyone in the ancient world that we have commenting on it is just completely amazed, blown away. Important to keep this in mind. Some of the distinguishing features of their civilization that we now recognize. Uh, one, they, they loved life. Wine, song, poetry, everything points to basically sort of fun-loving people. One reference I put to was they were the Americans of the ancient world. Not overly given to philosophical considerations, uh, but primarily focused, or at least in large part focused, on things like jewelry and makeup, which they had in extraordinary abundance. If you find anything in Egypt in a dig, it's either going to be jewelry or makeup. And this is men and women. Everybody was wearing it. Clothes, not so much. They uh, also commented, commented upon, particularly by some Greek historians, Herodotus, uh, that the Egyptians went around mostly naked most of the time. Uh, young people naked all the time. Um, older people tended to wear things like maybe a little wrap. You see the skirt that they always showed? That was sort of like for dressing up and going out. Uh, they also tended to apparently wear a certain periods, these are different periods, of course, there's a huge span of time, but at different periods they would, like, they would wear like a cape and nothing else, right? Ha ha, I have a cape. Uh, and so, but lots of jewelry, particularly in the Middle and Late Kingdoms, jewelry, jewelry, and more jewelry. And it's found, again, particularly in the Middle of the Late Kingdom, spread so widely through the population that it suggested a, a very uh, incredible distribution of the wealth. So you're know, still a top heavy, you have the priests and the aristocrats at the top, obviously the pharaohs, the rulers, but there's so much wealth everywhere. It, it, it just it was proverbial in the ancient world that, wow, Egypt is just, it's just gold. Streets are paved with gold. I guess that's sort of America. Of the, if you go there, you just will be rich because there's just jewelry and gold laying everywhere. This is how the ancient world perceived the Egyptian. And it wasn't, archaeological records suggest they weren't far off relative to other countries. A couple other distinguishing features that the ancient authors, again, of the Romans and the Greeks and the Persians commented on were the women. People keep asking me, well, well how are the women doing in any of these societies? Finally, I can happily report that in, if you were going to be a woman in the ancient world, Egypt was probably the place for you. I, I can find no better society to live in. Crucially, women inherited the property. It was matrilineal inheritance of material goods. This means a couple of things in practice. <clears throat> One, and, and, and at various times they had very good divorce laws for women. You know, you know, some countries at this time, the divorce laws, yeah, you just kill your wife and then you're divorced, right? It's sort of not so friendly. But here they could divorce and take a lot or even in some instances all the property. So this sort of, you know, keeps men in line a, a little bit more. Uh, also, the brother-sister marriage, which was probably the most common kind of marriage in ancient Egypt, because when the daughter married, she went to the new family. So it was matrilineal, but, the, the, but it was the, the daughter would marry to another family. Well, since she's going to inherit and take goods, that just means you shipped all your goods away. And so the way you could organize and keep the money in the family is you married brothers and sisters. And so in ancient Egypt, from very early times, 
Uh, brother and sister are synonymous with lover. They, 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 you, you can use them interchangeably. This threw, by the way, this threw researchers off for a little while. You can imagine how this is going to make it difficult to one. Well, they brother and sister. Well, that sounds more like lover. And then they finally realized, hey, wait a second. They're using the same. That's, they're synonymous in ancient Egypt. And so, uh, yeah, very, very clear records that that's, that's how you wanted to marry because that would keep the stuff in the family, keep the material goods together. Um, so there's a great evidence. They still were limited in sort of jobs that they could hold and all this. But that advantage of being able to maintain your material goods and pass it through the female line really put an emphasis. And we have all kinds of scrolls that, that deal with this. We even have pharaohs saying things like, my son, I want you to know the best way to ensure a happy and prolonged life is treat your wife well. Right? Because otherwise, you know, it's going to be bad. She's going to divorce you, lose all your stuff, and it's, it's ugly. So just be good to your wife. This seemed to be the, 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 one of the dominate, dominant themes. And so the, the rest of the ancient world was very impressed or bemused or shocked by this. That, that the Egyptian women would be out in public naked again often, um, you know, doing business and, and having property and really sort of not knuckling down like women are supposed to. Uh, but the most single great overriding thing besides the wealth and the strange social structure uh, that might jump out at us, one, one is no internal police force. There, that we have no evidence that there was any sort of internal policing at all. So this is a huge kingdom, hundreds of miles along the riverbank, hundreds of thousands of people, very dense populations that, which moved around Thebes sometimes, Memphis sometimes, Alexandria sometimes, depends on you know, what period you're in. Essentially no internal structure for policing the people. This was noted by some early commentators and certainly jumps out as the archaeological record. How do you do that? And until the late period, basically no standing army. And finally, when, when that period, when they get outside dominance, more or less they had just forgotten that you might occasionally need to fight somebody for some reason. Right? And so when they were conquered, it really wasn't much of a conquering. It was a more of, hey, that's sharp. Why are you pointing that at me? <laughs> You know, that was sort of the Egyptian response. I mean, they fought some good wars earlier, and they, but they, it wasn't what they were about. I mean, you read Roman history, they're about fighting. Even the Greeks were always fighting. Egyptian history is a lot more about, hey, let's plant some crops, let's drink some wine. Let's go over there in the bushes and make love. This is great. Life is great. Um, and the overwhelming presence of the priests. You, you can't exaggerate the amount of authority and power and massive investment that Egyptian society made into the priestly class and the religion. This in part becomes their undoing. Eventually the priests, not surprisingly, overthrow the pharaoh and try to run things and this goes very poorly and then they collapse shortly thereafter, leading to the dominance period. Um, this seems to be the glue that held the society together. You didn't need a police force because you had the priests and the people just sort of went along. And the priests didn't have a lot of moral commands. We're going to talk about this. It's important to note. They had more of a be good because the afterlife is coming. And we're going to sell you charms and magic spells and unctions and potions that will help you in the afterlife. Enjoy this life. Get ready for the afterlife. That seemed to be their general injunction. Um, how do we know all this? Three main sources. Again, we have the archaeological record. Massive. Uh, spread out. Impressive. But again, buildings only tell us so much. Think of this building. This building has been a hospital, a barracks, and now a school. If somebody digs it up in 3,000 years, they'll know the structure. They can figure some things out. But notice what a difference that makes. It's, you know, a hospital, a barracks, and a school to us seem like dramatically different uses. To archaeologists in the future, they would be like, hmm, what do we make of it? So archaeology is limited. Then we have the text again from the Greeks, the Romans, um, and the Persians, most notably probably Herodotus, because it's very clear from his text that he spent time in Egypt and was incredibly impressed. This is important, by the way. The entire Greek world was incredibly impressed with Egypt. 
They were not impressed with anybody else. Everybody else were barbarians, idiots, backwards, those stupid people. I mean, the references in Greek are always slanderous. I mean, they're just like, oh, the barbarians, which just means people who babble, they don't speak Greek. Uh, you know, the, the idiots, they're uncouth, oh, those bastards are no good. And basically, anybody who didn't speak Greek, the version of Greek you spoke in your house was an idiot. I mean, this is, except the Egyptians. And they're like, oh, except the Egyptians. Like, oh, those Egyptians, they've got it going on, right? They just, from the earliest days, we get these great, continuous just praise of the Egyptian system. And, and of course, the Romans. And we get the Roman text. The problem with that is, is when the Greeks go to Egypt, they write about Egyptians, from the Greek point of view, for Greeks. It, it, it would be just like reading travel logs of people who've come to America to write about America for somebody else. It's not that they're going to get everything wrong. It's just going to be a very weird take on us to us. And we go, well, you know, that's not really right, right? So that's, those biases are built in. The differences, for instance, the Egyptians didn't wander around going, wow, nobody's wearing any clothes. That's weird. They, that's how things are. They were used to it. This is one of the things that ever the Egyptians aren't wearing any clothes. Why aren't they wearing clothes? They should be wearing clothes. Um, you know, things that amazed foreigners didn't bother them at all. Didn't, didn't occur to them. And things that they were really interested in that we would like to know didn't seem to, you know, interest Herodotus at all. But that's what we had, again, until the Rosetta Stone. The decipherment of the Rosetta Stone allowed us to access... Greek texts themselves and begin to get the Greek worldview, uh, which is amazing. Right now, I, this is my estimate, by the way, we have something like 500,000 papyrus scripts. Not all of them have been translated, and we're discovering more all the time. One of the great discoveries was that mummies turn out to be wrapped in papyrus. Some of it just discarded, which is sometimes the most valuable. Because it's like, oh, I've got a fish, I need to wrap it in something. Oh, here's a newspaper. I'll wrap it in that. We've got this mummy we need to wrap. And by the way, they made a lot of mummies. So there's a lot of mummies. And so it turns out that a lot of them were wrapped with discarded um, papyrus. And so now that we're, get, we're getting, the, the archaeologists are getting good at unwrapping the mummies, which, ooh, whose job that is? I don't know. What do you do for a living? Well, <laughs> I unwrap mummies. Uh, uh, but, but being able to take the, the papyrus off and then, in, in a way that it can still sal be salvaged and read and used and translated. Um, and so we're actually getting more texts all the time. This is an ongoing. Our understanding is, is growing. There, there, it, it seems like it will go on for a long time because this is time-consuming and expensive. And there's a lot more mummies than there are mummy unwrappers, whatever that <laughs> actual profession would be. Uh, that's, that's the choke point. Um, so so 500,000 is, is a fair bit, but it's not... You know, when you consider the time periods we're talking about and the amount of documents that they produced, it's, it's just a tiny smattering, just the teeniest little bit, but it, more all the time. But when we have the temple writing. This is the pure hieroglyphics that we're used to seeing when we see these representations of it. Being able to translate that, the papyrus scripts, which we'll, which we'll talk about, um, has given us an insight into just an extraordinary civilization. So now I want to talk about the script itself. So if you look over on the back here, I hope they didn't copy that well, but it, it's, the Rosetta Stone didn't copy that well uh, after all those years. Um, the column on the right is hieroglyphics. I think if you look at it, you can make this out. The column in the middle is Greek, of course, obviously Greek. And the column on the left is demotic. This is demotic hieroglyphics, as it were. And the best way I can explain this is here's sort of the evolution of this. You start off with a pictogram. And a pictogram just means a symbol that represents that thing. So in my, this is not the way the Egyptians did it. They did beautiful work. So I make a little box with a triangle on top, and I say house, right? So here's the pictogram. Here's a house. This represents house. This is not confusing. No, we have a word. Well, they have a word. Uh, we have a word for house. There you go. So we say the word house. We think the pictogram house. That's, our, that's what we have so far. Spoken and then our symbol. Next you get what's called an ideogram. Now an ideogram develops almost immediately after you get a pictogram because there's all kinds of things you can't make pictures of. 
but seem closely related. So for instance, let's say safe. So we have the concept of safe, and we go, oh, we need a symbol for that. Well, let's use a symbol for house. Seems natural enough. But notice, there's no way for an outside reader to look at that and go, that means safe. We might get house, maybe, but we're certainly not going to get safe. At least it's going to take us a hell of a long time to get there. Right? Well, then you go, okay, we go safe, 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 safe. This symbol goes with safe. This symbol goes with house. And then we go, ah. You get a syllabary. Oh, I can barely say that word. A syllabary. Which is when you go, okay, every time you see this symbol, which means in a, as a pictogram, house, as an ideogram, safe, well, we always say safe, 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 safe. So we'll just make this the syllable, saw. So everybody, so everybody follow along? So originally, the symbol meant house, right? So it's just a picture of a house, so it means house. And because we associate house with safeness, eventually it picks up the idea along with that of safe. But now we're in an ideogram, because again, you, how do you make a picture of safe? You know? Well, you use a safe and safe and safe, and then pretty soon you go, well, we'll just associate this with the sound saw. So anytime you see this, it now means saw. And this is how these things go. And finally, it becomes an alphabet when you get rid of the syllable and you just have it represent a letter. Pictogram, ideogram, syllabary, alphabet. And we have this process happens in all kinds of languages throughout history. The great thing about the Egyptians is they use them all simultaneously. <laughs> this makes it really, really hard. I mean, wow, does this make it hard. Because you can get this symbol, and it can mean house. You can get the exact symbol, and it can mean safe. You can get this symbol, and it can mean saw. And you can get this symbol, and it can mean S. So if they had an Egyptian equivalent of the word sauce, they could write it like this. Now, if you're, you know, some Egyptologist trying to translate this, this could mean a safe house. Notice how logical that is, a safe house. It could mean sauce. It could mean house s. Maybe house is the plural for house. Or there's a word, sauce, which means, you know, fruit. <laughs> which has nothing at all to do with houses or being safe or any of it. And they use them all simultaneously. All simultaneously. So by the time this fully develops, you have over 500 pictograms that are possible. And then those are used ideographically in various combinations. They're used as a, a syllabary of roughly a hundred of those pictograms are also, because of course you think of our alphabet, if we have, what, 20 consonants, then you need a, a ba, bi, bi, bo, bu, which is, you know, all the consonants for b and each of the vowel sounds. So that's what makes it a syllabary. So it's, it's a sa and and you need to pick a different one for a C and then say. And then 24 of those, by the way, notice the correlation with our own alphabet, 24 alphabetic symbols in their alphabet. It's not, not, a, not a coincidence, by the way. This is where our writing system comes from. It comes from the development of their alphabetic system, which translated to the Phoenicians, which came to us from the Greeks and Romans. Um, so, a unbelievably complex, I mean, wow, hard system of writing. Everybody, does that, that make any sense? People sort of follow along there? Okay. So it means that you can get something like this and you have to look at it and you don't know what the hell that means. Now, well, of course, because the, the Egyptians like us, they struggled with this. The priests had no problem. They're incredibly well educated. They're ready to go. But even they got bored with this. So then they developed what they called a hieratic script, which was a mix between the pictograms, the ideograms, all the pictures, and then a few sort of shorthand abbreviations. 
which is what, if you look here, that's what's on the left-hand column. No, that's, that's Canadian one. There you go. Those little squiggles are shorthand versions. This eventually becomes a script called demotic. And demotic is sort of the cursive version that all the regular people would use when writing their documents because drawing pictures of ibises and you know the, all the hier hieroglyphs that we're used to seeing is incredibly time consuming and really hard. What this means, of course, is we also have a whole nother set of an alphabet. Well, not really an alphabet, but, but a way of writing all of this that was all jumbled together. So you'd get symbol, symbol, demotic word, symbol, ideogram, pictogram, pictogram, demotic word, symbol, syllabary, syllabary, symbol, demotic word. Yeah, it's a crusher. It's like, it's like you didn't get one language, it's like you got five languages all at once. You're like, okay, you translate. I mean, like I said, unbelievably, very much more difficult, by the way, than the Sumerian, the cuneiform writing that we talked about last time. They didn't do anything bizarre like this. So this is what we're, the, the scholars were up against. When I say they were really up against it, they, it was. But what this is also like a living history. All over the world, there we have histories of pictographic, we have traditions of ideographic Chinese, being the, the major example of a living ideographic language. Of course, we have syllabaries. We have, we're an alphabetic system. But as far as I know, they're the only culture that's ever had all of them, just all simultaneously. And let's just throw them together. This means a few things. One, very conservative. The, the archaeological record seems pretty clear. The last text written in very high classical pictographic hieroglyphics, 100 AD. So give or take 3,000 years after they were invented. They still had people up in Thebes, really north of Thebes, writing religious texts in the most ancient, I mean, I can't, I'm trying to equivalent today, I can't, we don't have, I mean, English is so new, so young, that we don't have anything that's 3,000 years old that we could keep writing. But it would be as if we had people writing new stories in, I don't know, what, ancient Greek, I guess, is the closest, or ancient Roman. Uh, that's, not, that's not long enough ago. I mean, we don't, we don't base it on anything that far back. And so, it also means that they were very well educated. Reading and writing are hugely expensive things to learn. This is why there were so many cultures, very rich cultures, very dynamic cultures, never developed them or never pursued them fully. It's the hundreds and hundreds of years of unbroken wealth and peace and prosperity that allow you to create such a rich and varied and amazing array of, of, of writing. And, and again, we're still not good at translating it that good. I mean, we've got it, but not great. I recommend everybody go look online and look at some of these texts. They're unbelievably beautiful. In fact, this is one of the things in doing the research that I was reminded of is early Egyptian art, late Egyptian art, middle Egyptian art. We do great art. We don't do anything better. Nobody ever has. I don't know if anybody ever will. If anybody does, I want to see it. The fluted columns that we so associate with ancient Greece are, you know, 2,000 years before they ever were even around. The, the, the Egyptians had those. And they're just gorgeous. They're amazing work. Um, probably developed glass. Their jewelry work Believe me, we would love to have their jewelry today. I mean, just unbelievable craftsmanship. But really, when I look at the papyruses from two, three thousand years ago, the, the workmanship, the coloration, the, 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 the calligraphy, the quality of this work, it just leaps out at you. It's, it's amazing. So we get a chance to go online, you know, they have images of a lot of this material, and it's just spectacular. If, if, there, if the Egyptians gave us nothing else, it's, it's something to shoot for uh, when you talk about calligraphy and, and the art of the book. Again, it just, just astounding. But what were they writing? Now, a lot of what's come down to us in carving, of course, are religious texts because they're in the tombs and the monuments. They say things like, wow, the king is great. 
Osiris as well. You know, sort of the, the endless litany that the ancient world loved to do of praising everything. Praise, 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 praise. I mean, I, I feel bad for the guys having to do this because you get a little tired of that after a while. But here's a few example texts that, that, that stuck, stuck out to me when I was looking through these. We have a great collection. It's called the Harper Song. It's on Harris 500. This is the name of the papyrus that it was discovered on. Isaac Harris, the guy who discovers it, papyrus in 500 at the British Museum. So love songs. This is, these, are, these are love songs. Your love mixes with my body. This is on the front page. Like flour mixed with water. Like love fruit mixed with gum. Like pastry mixed with honey. Pop songs haven't changed in three or four thousand years. Pop songs have been crappy for four or five thousand years. So when people tell you, wow, pop music sucks today, say, no, no, it sucks for five thousand years. I mean, it's just bad, right? Come quickly, be with your sister. Remember, sister means lover. Uh, like a war horse rushing into battle, like a farmer anxiously watching his plants. Heaven makes a girl long for love, like being away from light, like being too far from longed for arms. Um, yeah, just this, it's unbelievably sappy, bad pop music, and it's been going on. Some of it, by the way, is incredibly just sexually graphic. This sort of shocked the ancient world a little bit too, like I mentioned, but it just, songs like, I want you to come and, and lick my thighs and rub my breasts, and I want to feel your warm member inside of me. You know, I mean, this is like, okay, that's an opening line, I guess. I guess. Very, very subtle. Uh, <laughs> You know, so very graphic. Yeah. Um, but there's a lot of this sort of love poetry, which lets us know that, it, that, that this was common. But when you find multiple copies of things, when we found so little, it lets us know that that's probably not a coincidence. It means that this was probably common. And we find this, we've actually, it's a great discovery. We have these on a tomb from the Middle Kingdom, these songs, on the walls of a tomb. We'll talk about why that might be. And from a papyrus from the New Kingdom. So we know that many of these songs lasted for you know over a thousand years in continuous use. <laughs> yeah, for a long time, which is amazing to think about for, for golden oldies. Yeah, they just they just keep going. But another thing you get is a lot of religious stuff, of course, in tombs and whatnot. And here's two examples. Um, to give you a tenor of what's going on. I've heard those songs that are in the ancient tombs and what they tell extolling life on earth and belittling the region of the dead. Wherefore do they thus concerning the land of eternity, the just and the fair, which has no terrors? Notice this, the land of eternity, the just and the fair, which has no terrors. This is going to be important. Keep this in mind. Wrangling is its abhorrence. No man there girds himself against his fellow. It is a land against which none can rebel. All our kinsfolk rest within since the earliest day of time. The offspring of millions are come hither every one. For none may tarry in the land of Egypt. None there has not passed yonder. The span of earthly things is a dream, but a fair welcome is given him who has reached the west. The west, of course, where the sun goes, that's where we're all off to. The sun, Re, Amun Re, being the big uh, you know, central God. Notice, this is the notion of an afterlife that is peaceful, welcoming, lovely. Everyone's going to be there, all your friends. <clears throat> it's going to be great. Don't belittle the afterlife. It's going to be wonderful when you get there. It's peaceful. It's great. If you turn this over, by the way, this is from the same tomb wall. The gods who were before rest in their tombs. Blessed nobles too are buried there in their tombs. Yet who built tombs? Their places are gone. What has become of them? I have heard the words of Imhotep and Herodadeth, whose sayings are recited whole. What of their palaces, places? Their walls have crumbled. Their places are gone as though they had never been. None come to us from there to tell us their state, to tell us of their deeds, to calm our hearts. Until we go where they have gone. Hence rejoice in your hearts. Forgetfulness profits you. Follow your heart as long as you live. Put myrrh on your head. Dress in fine linen. Anoint yourself with oils fit for a god. Heap up your joys. Let your heart not sink. Follow your heart and your happiness. Do your things on earth as your heart command. When there comes to you that day of mourning, the weary hearted hears not their mourning. Wailing saves no man from the pit. Make holiday. Do not weary of it. Lo, none is allowed to take his goods with him. Lo, none who departs comes back again. <laughs> Same, same tomb. These were the same tomb walls. And so it gives us a sense that um, there was this debate going on in, 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 the, in the ancient Egypt. What's important here is that gods who were before rest in their tombs, blessed nobles too, are buried there. 
Those who built the tombs, their places are gone. What has become of them? In the old kingdom, hence the big pyramids, the Egyptian concept uh, of soul is really complicated. But two things that are important is the she, which is your breath, and the ka, which is a sort of... I mean, this is where it gets tricky, because, right, I mean, it's different. It's sort of a double of yourself. They also had a notion of your shadow that was important and, and other aspects. But it's sort of a double of yourself that goes on living as long as your physical body is taken care of and protected. If your physical body is destroyed, then your double dots. So the pyramids were built to protect the physical bodies of the pharaohs. They had food in there, water, everything that you need for the afterlife. So there's a whole system of these. I mean, the, 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 the pyramids are just sort of you know, monumental examples. Uh, but they, were, they had to be served by priests. Your name had to be spoken. This is the notion of things that are spoken, the breath. This is why these big temples and everything always have the names of people all over. Because when you said somebody's name, this kept them alive in the afterworld. They needed servants in the afterworld. It's had to keep going on and on. Then you get the problems, right? The, the Nile falls. The old kingdom ends. Well, when they rebuilt society, what everybody realized is like, oh, wait a second. We haven't done anything for any of these temples that we're supposed to be watching to keep those guys alive. And there's this major shift in the whole thing, and it becomes much more allegorical. You don't need literal people tending your grave. You need images on the walls. And so you get all these images of people working fields. This means when you get to the afterlife, those people will work fields for you. Many of the scrolls that the dead are wrapped in are scrolls that say, you know, I will work for you. Here is food for you. Pictures of food. Pictures. I mean, everything. Everything you have in this world for you in the afterworld. It's this concept of an afterworld just like this, except we don't die. Your car goes there. And there's a connection. As long as you do things right here, you're buried right and you're protected, then your car goes to an afterworld. And in the afterworld, you become essentially immortal. You live with the gods. Everything is happy. Another innovation happens now. This may start sounding familiar to you. But before you can get there, and this varies with time, but this is pretty much early in the Middle Kingdom, you are judged. Your worthiness is judged. And for the first time, you start getting this idea of, oh, if you have been doing wrong, then you may not be going to a happy place. You may be going to an unhappy place. And this either becomes being extinguished, your ka is killed, your physical body is destroyed by the gods, or here's a passage that I, that I dug up, not literally dug up, somebody dug it up, I just got it from the internet. Uh, the, this is from the Egyptian Book of the Dead. Thou goest round about heaven, thou sailest in the presence of Ra, thou lookest upon all beings who have knowledge. Hail Ra, thou who goest round about in the sky. I say, Osiris, in truth, that I am the Sahu of the God, and I beseech thee not to let me driven away, nor to be cast upon the wall of blazing fire. So my Ka leaves now, and you go up to Osiris. And Osiris decides whether or not you are worthy of going up to the land of eternal truth, which is where Ra lives, or Ray, or Amun Ray, variously translated various interpretations of this at different times. Have you seen the scarab beetle? So you put that over your heart because the scarab beetle, uh, they weren't sure how the scarab beetle reproduced, a very secretive animal, it seems. And so that would keep Osiris from reading your heart, which would give you a much better chance of getting in. <laughs> Right, so this is a way of sort of, there's all these things about tricking the gods. Lots and lots, if you read the Egyptian Book of the Dead, lots and lots of these texts are like, okay, when you get there, say this, don't say that. Do this, don't do that. You know, don't, don't insult them, be good. You know, don't lie about this. You can probably say this and get away with it. It's sort of like a legal, you know, argument going, get ready, they're, they're coming for you. But the crucial breakthrough here is twofold, or at least twofold. One is, what was obviously totally restricted to the wealthiest one, two, three percent of society, those who could afford to hire priests in, in perpetuity to protect, defend, feed, care for, and recite prayers over their dead body, branches out. It becomes a religion that 
a vast swath of the population can now participate in. Your body doesn't have to literally be preserved. That's the best, hence all the mummies. I mean, like I said, we have a lot of mummies because of this. But even the poorest person, a few spells, a few incantations, a special bracelet, a nice, anything, a tattoo, anything could, could help you along your journey. It becomes available, in theory, to everyone. And when you get there, it's going to be really great for everyone. And for the first time, you also get this inkling of, oh, and if it, which you can see follows naturally, right? Well, if you get there and you've been a rotten bastard your whole life, do you get to all this nice? And then, well, no, of course not. Osiris is going to pitch you out. And then there's this growing interest in, well, what, where is out, <laughs> right? What does it mean to be pitched out, right? Because if you're dead, it doesn't make sense to just kill you, uh, you know? And so we start getting these references, like uh, as I read there. Um, to being cast upon the wall of blazing fire. And so this, the, the richness of this idea is not in a religion that was, preaches morality per se. It preached sort of both of these seemingly contradictory theories simultaneously, which is why you can find them in the wall of the same temple, in the same burial chamber of, of one person. Because notice, on one hand, those seem contradictory, but on the other hand, they really are saying not that contradictory. Like, look, don't worry about the gods. Worry about living well here. And don't worry about the gods, because it's going to be nice when you get there anyway. So what at first seems like, hey, the, the one is very clearly like, look, those old temples have been abandoned. Yeah, they have, but that's not what they believed anymore. That whole system was gone. It's saying, don't believe that old system. We've got a new system. I and mean, this goes right through. Well, you'll see how far it goes right through. You may be getting an inkling of this already. Uh, that this goes right through to the new, new kingdom. This notion of, hey, there is an afterlife. Everybody potentially has access to it. But that the life here is also centrally important. Very practical people. Lots of business. Lots of you know, money. Lots of jewels, again. Uh, and so this is also what drives their huge creative impulse in arts and, and letters and sciences. I, I, you can't go through all this, but one of the things we should mention is, I, one of the jokes in one of the books I read is, the Egyptians had pi to 3.16. We have it to 3.1416, which is roughly, you know, a thousandth more accurate. And we got there in only 4,000 years, right? <laughs> so, you know, when you look at their mathematics, they were good. I mean, you build things like the temples, that takes a little bit of mathematics. But later and later, their mask is very good. It looks like they may have invented glass. Always hard to figure out, you know, when you look at these things, who's first on the scene. But if not them, but probably glass came from the Egyptians. All sorts of weaving and other art forms come directly from them. Again, the fluted pyramid is probably, if not invented by them, certainly influenced the Greeks. But it's really their intellectual heritage that's come down to us most strongly. If, if you look at the, like you say, look at the Sumerians when we talked about this last time, Epic of Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh goes out, wants to find immortality, and the gods tell him, look, you're a man, you die. Give it up. You don't get it. Period. If you read the ancient, you know, the Homeric epics, people die, but they go to this sort of completely undefined place you don't want to be. It's a, everybody goes to a bad place. Odysseus calls up a fallen dead king. I think it was Priam, but it slips my mind at the moment. Who was? And he comes up, and, and Odysseus can't help himself. He says, well, how, how is hell? And he says, I would rather be a slave on earth than a king in hell. But it's not really hell, it's just the place everybody goes. So this notion, of, if you read the Old Testament, they have no, no notion of an afterlife, they have this thing called shul, but it's really this vague concept of maybe something happens, but it's not going to be pleasant and you don't want to be there. It was this life, here and now. Persians start dealing with the Egyptians, then they eventually conquer, and you get Zoroastrianism. Almost immediately. Zoroastrianism starts to preach the notion that you have a soul, there might be an afterlife. The Greeks come into encounter, the more they deal with it. It's important to note that Plato traveled to Greece 
Probably the Pythagoreans traveled in Greece. I mean, traveled in Egypt. Plato went to Egypt. Um, they, many of them may have been educated in Egypt. And this is before Greece had taken over Egypt. So when you go to Egypt to learn things, you're learning things from the Egyptians. If anybody's read of something like the Phaedrus or any of the other Platonic ideas of the soul, it's completely un-Greek. One reason Socrates was put to death because they thought he was preaching against the religious beliefs of ancient Athens, and that's because he was teaching against the religious beliefs of ancient Athens. They didn't believe in this hierarchy of souls that go up to the land of pure knowledge, the land of Ray. This seems to be almost completely a Greek importation of an Egyptian idea of a soul, of an afterlife, of a place where pure knowledge comes from. If you look at Platonic ideals of the state, this wasn't the Greek city-state at the time, which was sort of these chaotic, democratic, uh, aristocratic fights. No, his ideal states are modeled on what they thought was going on in part in Egypt. Because he went to Egypt and was like, wow, look at this. It's huge, it's orderly, it's rich. And we've got some goats out over here in the pasture. You know, we like Athens looks real good until you go to ancient Egypt. You're like, holy cow. These people are doing things all right over here. And, and orderly and peaceful. And for someone like Plato, Plato's bent of mind, this looks very seductive. So, of course, from there, you start to get this notion of a soul, of an afterlife, of a heaven, of a hell. Again, Old Testament has none of this. You don't believe me? Go read it. Right? It's just not there. It's, it's just, it just doesn't exist practically. There's like one or two passages that might suggest this. The New Testament, written by what? A bunch of Greek guys, suddenly begins to emphasize this. By the time you get to the 1000 AD, 600 AD, 1000 AD, the church fathers have taken this on wholesale. Because now it's coming both from the Roman tradition, because Rome went and conquered Egypt, the Greek tradition, because many of the early church fathers were Greek, many of the apostles obviously were Greek, um, wrote in Greek, the Old New Testament written almost entirely in Greek. Um, and this idea from Egypt of an afterlife, of an immortal soul, of a heaven, of a hell, of judgment, of walking forward and having to face a day of judgment, that we have so centrally in the idea of, of, of our culture, whether you believe in Christianity or not, this, is, this notion is just central to, to what we believe about the world. And we have all these sayings about it. We have the notion of, no, if I should be able to put on trial, I should be able to receive a fair judgment. And then, and then a decision is made whether a good or an ill outcome, right? These, these concepts come not from the Greeks, well, they come via the Greeks, not from the Romans, because if you look at their early traditions, they have none of this. It's not from the cuneiform tradition, which we talked about in the first lecture, because they, have, Gilgamesh is explicitly told by the gods, forget that. That's not going to work. It's not for you. You don't have it. You're mortal. You die. Sorry, those are the breaks. But here we get it. Seems to be an Egyptian invention. As far as we can tell, they came up with it. And the only way I can try to imagine this is imagine you don't believe in a soul or a spirit. There is no afterlife, there is no judgment, there's no heaven, there is no hell. Even people who are completely talking to people who don't believe any religious thing at all, they'll use a word like, oh, well, you have a spirit, my spirit. And it's like, well, it's funny, right? Because <laughs> this, is, this is people did not believe in a spirit before. This complexity of spirit, in fact, ours is a grossly simplified version of what the Egyptians had. I think they would look at our notion and go, wow, that's really sort of sketchy and juvenile, you know, because that, like I said, like five parts to it is very complex, but it's very clear this notion of a permanent afterlife that you get to live forever is one of our inheritance from this Egyptian tradition. Um, another amazing inheritance, this is one of those moments of history that I, 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 it's almost unbelievable. So again, if you look at the timeline on the front, the Greeks take over in 332. And they're there until the Romans take over, and then the Byzantine Empire. Well, right after the Romans take over, the Romans go Christian. Well, right after, like 400 years after. The Romans go Christian. And when 
The Egyptian part of the Roman Empire goes Christian. You get the Coptic Christian Church. Now, as if this wasn't complicated enough, the Coptic language, which pre-exists Christianity, the Greeks invented this, of course, is ancient Egyptian speech, say the word sas is an ancient Egyptian word, written with the Greek alphabet. So it's the Egyptian language, but written with the Greek alphabet. Just like we use our alphabet, you can write French or German or Italian. Right? It's the same alphabet with different languages. So what the Greeks people, uh, what the Egyptian people were speaking, the Greeks wrote with the Greek alphabet, and this became Coptic. And so when the Romans took over, no one bothered to learn Latin. Everybody stuck with Greek and Coptic. And so when they Christianized, they became Coptic Christians because they produced Coptic Bibles, Coptic uh, hymnals, liturgy, so on and so forth. Today, the Coptic Church continues. Something like 10% of the population of Egypt is a member of the Coptic Church of Egypt. And there's a lot of people in Egypt, so that's you know, millions and millions of people. This is not like some teeny tiny sect someplace. Their liturgy is, of course, in ancient Egyptian. It's the same language. It's just been written with the new with the new alphabet. This has been continuously spoken in different dialects and variations for going on five thousand years, unbroken. It's not like a language that was lost and revived. It's a continuous change. It's been written with pictograms, it's been written with ideograms, it's been written with syllabary, it's been written with an alphabet, it's been written in demotic, it's been written in, written in Greek, which makes it the Coptic language. But it is the speech of Egypt. Now, of course, the dialects have undergone change in 5,000 years. This is no shock. But it is a continuous stream, still living in the liturgy of the Coptic Church of Egypt today. It, it just, just, you know, to me, it's, like, it's remarkable. We have it. Coptic religious texts were being written as late as 700 AD. Now it's mostly just used for liturgic, liturgical purposes within the church. But if you go to a Coptic service today in Egypt, and they're all over the world, they're not just in Egypt, but of course, most of those people are in Egypt, it's not in Arabic. It's not in Greek, it's not in Latin, it's not in English, it's in Egyptian. They're the last people in the world who actually speak their own language, right? That speak the, lingu the actual language of Egypt. Everybody else in Egypt now, of course, speaks Arabic or a few other uh, tribal dialects there. And so there's, there's this astounding river. And so I, I looked up the Ukologian of current Coptic liturgy. So this is one of the passages from the current Coptic liturgy translated into English. With the spirits of the righteous made perfect in death, give rest, O Savior, to the soul of your servant, keeping it for the life blessedness with you, O lover of mankind. In your repose, where all your saints find rest, give rest, O Lord, to the souls of your servants. 3,900-ish years earlier, thou goest round the heaven, thou sailest the presence of Ra, thou lookest upon all beings who have knowledge. The, Osir the, Osir the Osiris immortal, may he rest in peace, knows the names of your soul, the aspect of your soul that abides, give it rest. 3,900 years later, with the spirits of the righteous made perfect in death, give rest, O Savior, to the soul of your servant. This is a hymn to Osiris from 3,900 years ago. Rewritten, barely, <laughs> into the Christian liturgy of the Coptic Church that it survives today. This is recited right now contemporaneously in the language of Egypt. This is astonishing. But it's not just in the religious sense of the soul and of the spirit and the afterlife and the heaven and hell that we took from, from, from Egyptian. That, not that that wouldn't be enough and amazing. Uh, but it's also that whole conceptual building block. There's, there's a... 
uh, saying in philosophy that everything in philosophy is a footnote to Plato. They say this because so many ideas that philosophers worked on for so long were first encountered in Plato. Most importantly, this idea of an ideal perfect world that you have access to through your soul. That is pure Egyptian philosophy. This is not a Greek, this is why it's such a break. I mean, he's, he's, when you get these flashes, you're like, wow, where does this come from? This is amazing. Well, it's pretty clear where this comes from to me. It comes from Egypt, which he went to and visited and studied and learned from. This idea that there is a, another version of the world, that there's more perfect forms, that there is an ideal, invisible world that we can access through, that it's spiritual, not necessarily in the religious sense. All, all of these concepts that influence our poetry, our literature, our philosophy, that just seem to us natural, as some sort of, you know, just this is the way things are. Well, those, they are, seem natural to us because, again, the stream, unbroken, 5,000 years of this concept in Egypt has just poured out to us. And look at the influence it has if you, if you look at the Quran. This is, this is not far off there either. One reason I think that Arabic, Arabic and, and, and Islam has been so successful in Egypt is because in a lot of ways they were ready for it. Um, famously, we have the rebellion of Akhenaten. The Egyptians had a lot of gods. Maybe only the Indians could come up with more. The Indians had an unbelievable number of gods. But uh, during Akhenaten's reign, he tried to go monotheistic really fast and really hard. Um, and this turned out to be wildly unpopular, if for no other reason it made a lot of priests unemployed. Uh, and and, and, and uh, pissed off a lot of people. And of course, all of this is, it would be as if whoever was elected the next president just got up and said, you know what, we're all becoming Hindus. Everybody. The whole, the whole, you all have to change tomorrow. It didn't work then, it wouldn't work now. Right? But what it proved was that this was available in the Egyptian psyche. If Akhenaten hadn't been such sort of an idiot in a way, such an absolute fundamentalist, he could have just said, oh look, Amun Re, which people had already said, I and mean, he didn't invent this, is the king of the gods, and everything else is really an aspect of Amun Re. Everyone said, oh yeah, that's fine, we don't care. That's great. But he went, I mean, he just tried to eliminate all the gods, he did crazy things. But that means that that monotheistic impulse was already there. They were polytheistic, but it was always focused on a very narrow range of gods, and all focused eventually on Re. The sun god for you know welcome to Egypt obvious reasons, and so you know that that move seems to be implicit there, and you can see it in some of the writings where they refer to one god. You can see it in some of the hymns and some of the songs and much of in some of the depictions in the pyramids, uh, the temple art, and so that, that's one of the reasons I think again Coptic Christianity had not had, had that much problem moving in. Uh, Islam didn't have that much problem moving in. I mean people are like yeah okay hey, this is not that far off in some ways to what we already believe. The influence was also the other way. Again, soul, spirit. I mean, the, again, um, unbelievable. And so these are the riches that we've come, that, we, that have come down to us from the Egyptians. Uh, art, unbelievably beautiful. In, in some ways, a model of what a civilization can be. Think about this, again. Hundreds of thousands of people spread out over hundreds of miles. No police. They just, just didn't exist. You had an internal cohesion built through shared communal belief system, basically. An astonishing achievement. Women could have property. There's a good breakthrough for you. Our alphabet based in part, probably through the Phoenicians, from the Egyptians. Math, sciences, letters, all these things. But I think really, if you, most importantly, the crucial breakthrough for their influence on us is this a notion of a soul that's immortal, an afterlife that we're going to, and the fact that we're going to be judged. Wow, how influential has that been on our cultural, intellectual, artistic heritage? I, I can't even, I, can, I don't even know how to begin to discuss that. But it comes from this civilization that lasted for thousands of years along the banks of the Nile. So that's Egypt. Thank you very much.